Okay, all right. It takes, uh, there's a usually a little bit of a lag time. So this is a joint meeting of Senate Appropriations and Senate Health and Welfare. And so uh, we wanna um, uh, talk further about our concerns that were generated by the proposed reduction um, in the advance payment uh, to our primary care providers by one care. Um, and I know that this is a um, uh, concern that is beyond just um, appropriations. It probably has some, um, mm -hmm. transcends multiple committees in some ways. Um, so we um, uh, had um, just some preliminary committee discussion relative to the concerns that have been expressed either to us directly or by reading news articles and having um, sort of going through uh, why now and why would we, when we talk about the um, importance of primary care and strengthening primary care and um, recognizing that it's critical role that it plays in healthcare reform, would we uh, be taking, uh, not we, but why this action is being proposed now and should, um, and should we um, take any kind of um, uh, steps at this point and what they might be. So um, that's, that's why uh, we're very happy that we could do this jointly uh, so that we can perhaps come forward with a plan that we think um, makes sense and we can do it um, as expeditiously and as simple um, as possible, recognizing that probably in the long term, this is a topic of much more discussion. So um, Senator Ash or Senator Lyons, um, do you want to have any comments? I, I would like to comment uh, from the health and welfare perspective. And yes, we have also discussed this in our committee. Uh, we've looked at the rate setting issue um, uh, as an issue of equity and equality um, since January. We have not focused on the ACO rate setting process, but have looked at how we could improve the rate setting process overall. However, with the um, proposal that the ACO has put forward to have a lower standard for primary care, uh, understanding of course that it's not a fixed standard that it would depend on the quality of care and the metrics involved but our concern is significant and especially given the timing of this during the COVID epidemic. We did hear from the Green Mountain Care Board uh, and the chair of the board also expressed concerns about the timing of this. And I think um, I was going to bring a proposal to our committee and I think uh, Senator Kitchell and Senator Ash similarly we're interested in bringing a proposal to appropriations. So I think it's really appropriate, uh, appropriate appropriations and health and welfare work together um, to uh, evaluate what, what's happening. Um, I, did, I, do, I did a little research and I do know that according to rule five, the Green Mountain Care Board rule five, uh, number 17, that the Green Mountain Care Board does have the authority uh, with rate setting. And um, so they are the ones who would ultimately be responsible to, for responding to this proposal. However, <laughs> I think uh, as legislators, we uh, need to put something forward ourselves. Uh, I don't think we can, uh, we can let this go. I've heard from a I can't tell you how many primary care docs I've heard from since this has happened and I've been communicating uh, back and forth with them. So uh, I do think this is uh, something that we need to look at. Senator Ash. Uh, um, yeah, I'll just, I'll be brief. And I, because no matter what I say, um, it, within certain quarters, it'll be represented as being anti-hospital or anti-whatever. I could, I could praise them to high heaven. I'll be accused of that. If I criticize something they do, I'll be accused of it. So I don't really care at this point. I'm going to be rather blunt. I find the proposal, not just ill-timed, but completely contrary to everything the Health and Welfare Committee, the Senate, 
the legislature have been trying to accomplish in terms of prioritizing upstream primary care preventive investments. And it can be couched in all of the sort of pseudo technogarble that people want, but it is an attempt to squeeze independent primary care practices who have been squeezed, frankly, for the last two decades uh, by the insurers. And every, it's always, for some reason, primary care, which is the sort of underfunded aspect of our system, has to be subjected to all of these hoops that have to be gone through in order to uh, be rewarded. And I never hear One Care or any of the healthcare establishment talking about putting the same types of hoops and constraints in front of public relations spending, government affairs spending, lobbying, advertising, and all of these new high paid positions that keep being layered on top and going to connected people. So for once, I'd like to hear them to put them through a risk corridor before we talk about primary care. So um, I'm also worried about timing. Uh, Ginny, you're exactly right. The timing is uh, unfortunate for a couple of reasons, one of which is these practices have to make uh, decisions on contracts by September 11th, um, so just a week away. Um, so that has not given them a tremendous amount of time to understand the implications and make decisions. So um, what I hope is that we can find a way to uh, provide language because we, we can only count on our own actions, but not the board or one care. So hopefully we can find some language that both, you know, predominant uh, or majority of the members of the both committees feel good about and we just get it done and move it over to the other, other chamber. <clears throat> and toward that end, um, uh, just to get us started, I believe uh, Jen Carby has done a preliminary draft that we could look at that would be, um, uh, would be uh, an, something that is an immediate response. It's simple and um, a statement from the legislative perspective regarding um, this proposal. I don't know if you, um, um, do we have that um, available, Jen? And thank you very much for making yourself available this afternoon as well. Sure. I, I mean, I have the language. I could. Um, I Did can... I lose Senator Ash? No, Go he'll be back. Bookshelves. Okay. No, he'll be back. He'll be. All right. Be back. Oh. There he is. <laughs> there he is. Okay. You're muted. I'm. You enjoyed saying that. I'm circling. I'll be back. All right, as long as you can hear. All right, Jen, he's, do you want to? Probably getting his steps in. You want me to just put up the document? Is that Why the best you? way to do it? Okay. All right, it is short, it's just a sentence. Um, so this says, notwithstanding any provision of 18 BSA section 9382, that's the Green Mountain Care Board certification and budget review for accountable care organization statute. Notwithstanding any provision of that to the contrary, the Green Mountain Care Board shall not certify an accountable care organization to operate in this state during calendar year 2021 if the organization intends to reduce the amount of its per patient per month payment to primary care practices for any part of 2021 below the payment amount that was in effect on July 1st, 2020. Pretty straightforward, simple. Yeah, that looks good. Um, this is this is the first time we, you know, we've really um, had a chance. It, as I said, this was a draft that um, Jen prepared in anticipation of this discussion around um, uh, making a legislative, taking a legislative position on uh, primary care and this proposed reduction. Um, comments, uh, Senator Ingram. Thank you. Uh, well, are, are we going to hear from one care? I'd like to, is uh, health and welfare going to take testimony? I mean, I'd like to actually hear them. Um, I can, all, all I know about what's going on is what I've read in the press and I, my opinion of the press is about on a par with uh, President Trump's opinion of the press <laughs> at, at this point. So We did receive a letter. Uh, uh, Senator Lyons, did you get that from One Care as well from uh, Ann Bodette? We Baudet? did receive a letter from One Care. I think it went out to both committees. I'll make sure that the committee has it, uh, that it's on our web page. Uh, One Care has sent out two letters and I'll double, I'll double back uh, to uh, see what both of them are. And uh, they the, leave? Let me just report. 
Right, and we have the report, but the, my concern, Senator Ingram, is uh, that September 11th is right around the corner, and so that's a week away. And uh, if for us to, uh, this has been sprung on us fairly quickly during a very difficult time. We understand uh, that our primary care is the most important part foundation for health care. So I'm, I'm inclined to move forward with this and uh, at least a conversation about how maybe to improve the language that we have in front of us. We will, we will obviously hear from one care through uh, a written communication. And if we can find time in our schedule, we will put them on for testimony. There's no doubt about that. But we are <laughs> under a very uh, a, a short time frame in a short time frame. I can imagine how far it was. Senator McCormick, you had your hand up? Yeah, I just want to say, yeah. Yeah, I just want to say that I, I, I'm impressed by the admirable simplicity of the language. I think it says what we need to say. And, uh, okay. Let's get it Thank done as quickly you. as possible. Sometimes simple is better. Um, Senator Nitka. Um, what would be the impact on the subscribers if, if this were to pass? Do we know? I, I, my, my impression would be that it would be reassuring to folks who would not leave. Uh, I would hope that they wouldn't leave and that we would continue to have providers in the system. So uh, we don't know. We don't know what the effect would be. I'm certain we'll, we'll certainly hear from them. I would think in the same way we'll hear from others. You mean before we do it or later? I, you know, I think that we're going to hear right after this meeting, possibly during it. I, I expect your instincts are right, Senator Lyons. Um, and um, I mean, there is a vehicle um, to do this very quickly. It's a bill that I originally sponsored that you could take back and put this language on and I'll, de I'll declare defeat for another session on uh, my healthcare administration agency. But I will be back. <laughs> well, maybe, assuming um, I return in January. Um, so other uh, comments, Senator Starr. Yeah, I just think that, you know, what's been said is so true and accurate. Um, you know, I don't think we can, simple is the best way to do it. And what Jan just read to us, um, notwithstanding language, is about as clear as you could make it. And I would hope that health and welfare uh, could deal with this Tuesday morning and we could deal with it Tuesday afternoon in, in our committee and get it on the floor maybe as quick as Wednesday. <clears throat> the, the timing is really a challenge as Senator Lyons indicated. And um, that came from a letter that we got that date was in the letter we got from uh, One Care. Um, I'm sorry, I, I can't find the letter. I I don't know if I received it or not, but I I, haven't, I can't find it anywhere in my emails or anything. So I, I I haven't seen any letter from One Care. So I am looking right now, and I will uh, forward it to you. Thank you. And that, as I think Senator Starr's suggestion of timing is uh, probably good. Um, well, the we, we can clear this too. Well, that's the point. It is an S bill that we're talking about, uh, uh, sort of doing this. I, I, we're talking about a strike all, I think. And, um, mm -hmm. or a proposal of amendment to the bill. Which one are you thinking about, Senator Kitchell? I, I would give up this study, just do a strike all and just make it a single purpose bill at this point. We don't, okay. we don't have an H bill that we could tack this on, so it would go quick. Uh, we could, go, I, would it no, go any faster I, than if we just send over an S bill? No. No, no I, don't I don't think, think so. so. 
whole new topic. It, yeah. Well, um, it would go faster if if you had a house bill that you could strike the language out of that has already passed the house, send this back over. Uh, you could even send it late. Uh, well, no, we'd have to look at it. Yeah, you still have to, we'd still have to vote it. Yeah, yeah Wednesday not, would be the earliest possible. Yeah. So, but I think I have, the timing yeah. that we just talked about is, unless we want to do it over the weekend, <laughs> um, is real, okay. and, and, and it is a holiday weekend. That's the other thing. Yeah. Um, although I would think that if we in fact act on Tuesday and pass something out and suspend the rules, it is a very strong statement around the legislators, legislature's view about the importance of our primary care um, provider community. And what we have, everything we read and everything we're told um, just reinforces the uh, importance of having that provider group strong and involved. So. Um, Senator Ash, do you have any uh, ish suggestions relative to timing if um, health and welfare took something up? Uh, can you take, that bill would have to be recommitted, it's on the calendar? No. It wouldn't have to? No, if it's a strike all amendment, it'd no. just be, the uh, reports wouldn't be offered and then there'd be an amendment from whoever wanted to offer. Okay, that so that would work pretty fast then. It would have the effect of striking out the underlying bill, not the reports of the committee. And just for clarity, this bill is not, the bill that's on the calendar is not getting taken up by the house no matter what. So it's not disrupting, a, no offense, Senator Kitchell. I know you said- I, What you're saying- no, you, said you're willing, you said you're willing to wave the white flag of surrender. <laughs> I think that actually is- uh, <laughs> It's that, 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 flag been has already been, that flag has so been waving for so long it's it's tattered and probably needs to be burned on flag day i, I um, don't know why you have to rub it in <laughs> there isn't much of the flag left to rub in <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh more salt in the wound uh, so so Jane, i did family leave for 10 years before anyone took it up so have faith <laughs> all right so there is, an, if you would prefer, there is an H bill in Senate Health and Welfare for which the content has already been enacted in something else, if that's What's preferable. That? H 723, an act relating to telehealth, all of the language from it went in Act 91, the COVID bill. Yeah. Well, Just another, another possibility if you want. Another I think yeah. either either is fine. The advantage of that one is if it goes over to the house and they adopt it, then it's done. Um, yeah, it's over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's. Uh, that, but thank then, you, Jen. Uh, that's a good suggestion. Yeah, that's a very good suggestion. I mean, my question is this: uh, that it is a bill that's in committee, so we would have to uh, pass pass it as a strike all, send it up over to appropriations. Uh, yeah. Would have to be after the floor on Tuesday, so it would go to appropriations Tuesday afternoon. No, I would. Then... I could ask not to have it referred to us. It's not a money bill. Well, okay, that's fine. Not spending any. So if we could it, figure that out, yeah. um, Senator Rash, um, the mechanics never, of that. It that bill um, on the House side, I just looked, only went to health care, not to. Ways and means or appropriations, so okay. it would it would not need to go through extra steps to bypass uh, another committee down the hall. Okay. As, it's, uh, this is a question for Senator Rash. Has anybody had conversations with the House um, leadership at all? Uh, not yet. That's very important. Yep. Mm -hmm. I don't know about Senator Lyons. Have you had any conversation? No, I was waiting for this meeting before I uh, did that. And I'm, okay. I will, I uh, defer to uh, Senator Ash to talk with uh, House leadership. And then yeah. I'm happy to talk with Representative Lippert if you would like. Okay. My, my overall feeling is if people wanna move forward, even, even if we had no assurance from the House, it would still be worth passing. Um, Definitely. 
I, I think it's worth passing, but I think. Um, I agree. No, I, I agree. I'm just, just to, to quote a senator who shall go unnamed, I'm just saying. Uh -huh. um, I, I've heard that before from someone. That there's the committees have put in too much work for policies like this to be done sort of extra, you know, in a, in, in this, through this bureaucratic forum and not have any response. <laughs> well, well, thank you. So, uh, Jenny, then you were, um, um, then the plan is that Tuesday morning after Labor Day weekend, this will be, um, uh, on the committee agenda, and then you will use that H bill that Jen Carby referenced. Um, that seems to be a the most expeditious way, and um, and move it quickly, huh? <laughs> well, I think uh, we, as I think Senator Ingram uh, is right. We will invite uh, One Care in, and we will invite uh, Green Mountain Care Board back so, should they wish to comment. Um, but I think that would probably be sufficient at this point. I've heard uh, a significant amount from a number of people in different er places of leadership who are very concerned about this. So, uh, and I think, I, th I think that we need to reassure ourselves that this is not about uh, condemning the ACO process or all the work that is going on, especially in prevention and linking our community services with our uh, hospitals and other healthcare providers. So this is not about that, but this is about ensuring that primary care is sustainable financially and that we're, we, we need to be very careful before we uh, put a downturn in their reimbursement uh, opportunities incentives. Senator Ash. If, um, if the bill doesn't pass, I think we have to uh, put money in the budget to give everyone a copy of uh, Yankee Magazine's Home Remedies <laughs> Manual. Yeah. Since we won't have primary care practices in many parts of the state anymore, we'll need to okay. go back to the old ways. And um, <clears throat> if you're taking testimony, I, it seems to me two key questions um, emerge and one is um, if this is a time to bring certainty why why is this action being taken now at this time and why um, why why um, uh, does this decision um, um, not work counter to all our public policy goals about strengthening um, primary care in our healthcare reform initiative. I, I think those are the obvious questions that emerge from this. You're right. Thank you. Okay. Um, my Senator, uh, Senator so, Sears, you had your hand up, and then Senator well, Lyons. These things happen. See, thought we had healthcare policy and overall policy for the state of Vermont that we had developed. And these things seem to happen haphazard. We deal with little parts of the system. The system itself is so huge that um, we end up dealing with the little problems as they arise. So somebody decides that it would be great to cut primary care reimbursement um, at the expense of who? then it seems to me that we need a much more coherent coherent policy for health care and how we're providing it. And I, I don't know if Senator Lyons or the members of the Health and Welfare Committee have kind of a mission statement or something that can guide us as to and guide the public as to what our health care policy is, because it really is difficult. I'm not, you know, I, I'm just having a hard time following how we would get to this point. So Senator Sears, your comment just precipitated question number three and how this proposed change um, aligns with our policy of healthcare delivery reforms. 
Exactly. So could I please get a copy of our policy on healthcare delivery reform? <laughs> oh, I just so, made. I get, I, wait, okay. I, 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 let me let me interject here. Um, I, I think there are a lot of questions in what you're asking, uh, Senator Sears, and they're very good questions. Uh, remember that the uh, the the all payer model that we've embarked on over a period of five years is pretty nascent, and COVID has interrupted its progression. So uh, obviously, it is all about building a system of primary care and prevention. And we've worked assiduously to do that. And that includes both our community service programs, our prevention council, <coughs> our chief prevention officer, and then in the healthcare side, uh, focus on primary care. What has happened with this particular proposal that we're concerned about is lowering the, in the incentive for primary care providers. So if you're a primary care provider, and I, I can't speak for what the ACO has done here uh, or the, or the um, exact uh, metrics around it, but there's a range of possibility for reimbursement for our primary care providers. This has made it a lower base. Uh, it also has increased, I think they've increased um, the higher level as well, but it's based on quality outcomes. So it is, it is, a, it, it is a complex uh, piece of, it's a complex recommendation that's been made, but it's absolutely been made at a time when primary care providers are already in dire financial stress and thinking that they might have to prove themselves all over again and justify their existence for a much lower rate of uh, income. And so that's, that's, what our, that's, that's our concern. Your question about what is our delivery mission, what's our vision, what's our uh, statement? It is about prevention and it is about primary care. So we're losing, we um, Senator Ingram, thank you for giving us a half hour. Um, and, um, so uh, I'm just wondering um, in terms of further discussion um, right now, or shall we, um, uh, now that we've sort of had okay. this framework <laughs> discussion, uh, let the Health and Welfare Committee um, uh, work on Tuesday morning to come up with what we would recommend as our um, Senate response. Senator Starr? Yeah, I, I just want to point out that it's critical that health and welfare get this done Tuesday morning, not Wednesday morning or Thursday. Uh, you know, we, you've got to get on it early and come to a resolve by the end of the morning. Uh, if we're the going cattle to uh -huh. I know. You got to milk those cows. We don't get up that early, Senator. Well, I know I how you do, issue, but this is not time to not there's not time to uh, let it drag because the lobbyists will come in and try to work their way in to drag this on. So, well, that's let's, what, you know, listen, we we'll, we'll be taking testimony, but here's what I would uh, well, here's what I would suggest. I will have uh, Nelly sent an inv a Zoom inv invitation out to uh, appropriations committee members and ask if you would like to participate in that meeting, you're very welcome to do so. So, um, I, I, so uh, Senator Kitchell, would you like to have that um, invitation sent out to your committee? I'm sure, although you've got two members. Uh, I already got two, we'll you, have you already a have two. Just make sure she has Bobby's correct email address, please. Yeah. No, uh, I'm I'm booked up starting at eight o'clock uh, Tuesday morning. Um, so, but, but thank I, you, thank you. I'm I have a feeling that it, it might be your committee that's kind of leading the herd on this one, Jimmy. Yeah, Richie and Dick, uh, Richie <laughs> and Dick, and they'll be there. They'll and, help. Um, and having the advantage of this joint meeting and Jen Carby being here as well um, to listen and Nolan is, I think, 
going to help that committee process move ahead. Um, seems like it's pretty straightforward, you know. I mean, what? I why Senator, are we reducing now? Senator so, Cummings had a question. No, um, it's, this is not a question. I was going to ask Chair Lyons. Could we just say we're not going to take up another bill on Tuesday until we're finished with this one? Oh yeah. So well, that, we don't we're end up with you know. Agenda. Don't worry. We'll, yeah. we'll we'll take care of that. Yeah. <laughs> Senator Starr has made sure of that. Yeah. Just go in, you make the motion, you go home. What is this problem? All right. <laughs> okay. All right. It's still Thank asking you. my my question. And oh. Jen, I hope Jen will send me the policy on healthcare delivery for the state of Vermont. Well, our goal is the transformation of healthcare. Right. Of there the is no delivery policy. system. Yeah, there isn't. Oh, but um, that's right. So I understand in criminal proceedings, you always, you never ask a question you don't know the answer to. That's is correct. that true, Senator Sears? That is true. And you knew the answer. I believe I know the answer, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's part of our problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, we, we, demand, I mean, we demand of other agencies of state government. But I, I, I can't defend that. Uh, that the answer to that question, but what I can say is that we are, we are in the middle, not even the middle, we're approaching the middle of an experiment on all payer reform that will guide us toward uh, our policy. So, uh, it might okay. interest the, the senator to know that my first term I was on the Health and Welfare Committee when we did health care reform. And hmm. Governor yes, Howard yes. Dean pulled a sheet over it when it died in the house, I believe. Oh, are you talking uh, about when we had the health care authority created and all that, Senator I, Sears? I, you know, my the details escaped me, but uh -huh. um, okay, it was going to be wonderful. The, yeah, I heard that the Free Press had a headline of legislature about to approve ninety million dollar tax increase for health care, so, something of that nature, something like that. I was under Cheryl there Rivers' then. leadership. That was under Cheryl Rivers' leadership. Yeah, wow. I wasn't there then. Well, mm. I think Jan, uh, Helen really was chair of health and welfare. Yeah. Jan Backus was involved, but Cheryl was sort of the driving. But the driver. That, you're talking a different era, Dick. A different one. Yeah. Is that earlier? You're talking than that? the second time. Uh, I think this was Howard Dean when he first tried. It was, it was the first time when Howard Dean tried. Right. I think you should ask Bobby. The Republicans were actually in control voting. of the Senate at the time. Yeah. Ralph Wright was the speaker. And, um, oh my goodness. Well, this is ancient history and I'm sure. Uh, I, um, well, we've been doing a lot of that today because judiciary took up Woodside. Oh, and I, <laughs> I did a, a sort of a historical uh, revisit of our hazard pay um, bill. Yeah. So this has um, been a historic day historic all right thank you what i'm going to suggest is that we come to closure on this because i need to communicate with my committee assistant to uh collect uh people who might testify and to have jen in to have nolan in so we can look at some of the fiscal um repercussions of what we're doing what they're doing or what they're doing not us um and okay. uh, so we're good. Thank you, Jenny, for uh, getting well, you probably this uh, on the top I, of your I, list so quickly. Well, uh, this was going to be on my list for another bill, H795, but this uh, puts it in a faster uh, mm -hmm. fast track. So okay. that's fine. Okay. Well, thank you for um, I'm glad you were available this afternoon. Do you have another committee meeting then to leave no. for? Anne, no. are you have your committee meeting no, this afternoon? No, I'm. I got a couple members who are not happy. Oh, being in uh, session. So I'm the only. Am I out of the three chairs? I'm the. I'm until five o'clock. Yes. 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 Every yes. other day. Slave driver. driver. <laughs> All right. Well, um, okay. Stephanie. Stephanie, are you there? I am here. All right, so our agenda was obviously to do this first thing, and yeah. then we were moving into committee discussion on the budget. Okay. 
Is that right? Is that what the agenda is? <laughs> I've got two screens and I uh, and, and my I, iPhone and I'm Senator Kitzel. We just had a we had a, just a general committee discussion. We didn't have a specific topic. That's what I that was yeah. my recollection. So I'm going to ask um, committee members. Stephanie did a good job of identifying areas that um, um, are um, out, uh, you know, are, are that we're going to have to consider. Um, I am trying to make sure that we are keeping lists of what's um, coming our way. Um, Stephanie is uh, trying to. Um, I have the um, list we talked about several days ago. Yeah, um, and it seems like we're talking about two two lists, one of which are potential CRF funding needs, yeah. and then the other would be uh, one time general fund or uh, general fund um, requirements. Um, I had uh, I sent out to the committee uh, um, um, the email that I received from Chair of GovOps, and they're wondering if it's possible to give the um, council, I believe that Senator Sears was involved in creating on racial bias, mm -hmm. um, more money for the work that they're having to do. My question is, could we use CRF? Uh, do they, is there a possibility of using more CRF that gets to the end of this calendar year? If in I fact they I have the work. I I would suggest there is. And the reason for that is the large number of minority populations who've been adversely affected by the COVID-19 as seen in the Winooski situation and several others around mm -hmm. the state. So I, and around the nation, certainly um, all the <coughs> uh, lower income minority folks mm -hmm. getting hurt worse than others. So. So if we could, we put in 50,000 the first go round. I know they were requesting 150, but if we could at least start out looking at 50 through the end yeah, of I December mean, from CRF and then. As I understand it, we're basically asking this one person to weigh in on everything in every committee. And, well, and you know, it's not next to impossible for one person. She's and doing the a other, fantastic um, job, by the way. And the other is the extent to which she has to contract or get you know additional yep. help and so right. forth to yep. to um, support this workload, which um, uh, and and I I want to say I think um, our building on the creation of this office and putting that first fifty thousand um, um, to um, to that office I, as we're sitting here now I think that was um, certainly a good step and the importance of that work, I think every day is coming home to us in a variety of ways. So if you could check Stephanie to see if we could at least pick up some of it under the CRF that, you know, until the end of the year yes. and what that might be, I think it, that would be helpful. Um, other um, areas that we want Just more to, to The budget as it's come to us from the administration does put 65 CRF into the attorney general's office I'm not that. talking about the attorney okay. general. I'm talking about yep. a, a Zuzana Davis's office. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Senator Sears. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to mention Woodside for a moment because we spent quite a bit of time in Senate Judiciary this morning on it. And we have um, our recommendation is that we look at what they're doing right now as a short term plan, that we support that, but that we not say that they have a plan in place. Mm -hmm. I do not, I don't even think they can say that they have a plan in place. They're not even allowed to, you know, they haven't even entered into the contract with Beckett. They're in conversations with them. Um, they've contracted with Sununu for up to five beds at $1,500 a day. Um, they're trying to work through all these different things. So I, while we'll have to do something in the budget on it, I'm very troubled by the idea that um, they've solved the problem and we just walk away and, and uh, relinquish um, to them, whatever. So, and they don't even know yet if, if Beckett, if the program they're proposing at Beckett will be Medicaid eligible, which will have a huge impact on the general fund. So um, we need some language. Is that what you're suggesting? I mean, I'm obviously- I'm suggesting that we continue the language that, that we not um, say that they've got an approved plan. 
Um, right. We had That's the language in the in the budget adjustment on Woodside. I think it was budget adjustment. And okay. I think that we leave that in place, or if we need to reference it, we say that that's still in place, that that has not, they have not met that yet, and they need to go to joint fiscal and justice oversight if we're out of session, <clears throat> their plan. All right, I think what you're saying is that um, interim- um, Alice. Uh, Alice? Sorry, yes, that's what was said. I mean, it's, there so, isn't there isn't a solid plan at this point. So what you're saying is what might be interim expediency because it has to be done should not equate to a long-term plan. Right. Exactly. Okay. And I, so okay. I think we need to reference that language in the, okay. in whichever bill it was in, I think it was in the budget adjustment. It was either that or the Q1 bill and I'll, I'll, I'll get, I'll dig it up and send it around. Okay. Okay. But um, did, did other comments? Yeah, I, I wanted to check the price out. Did you say fifteen hundred a day? I did. Yes, one thousand five hundred dollars per day for the state of New Hampshire. But they are taking the most difficult kids we have that are impossible to place. And um, I realize that sounds huge, but when you do it over a yearly basis, it's much less than the six million we're paying to keep Woodside right. open. On the other hand, that is about 650,000 per year, um, all general fund money. So if you, and they, their contract is up to five kids. So, so that's like three, have, three, three and a half million or something. Exactly, which is why I just said, I don't think we can say that that is a finished plan yet. Okay. All right, um, so that's um, other things from, then we have your justice reinvestment issue. And right. you said that- um, Well, that I'm asking you had the some discussion. Is it 3 I'm million, 300 or 500? 400. I'm asking you the Mary commissioner- split to, the difference? No, I'm at, no, that money she's working on. I'm working on an additional, the Senate Judiciary Committee would like to see an additional, $400,000 come from a reduction of out-of-state beds to fund batter inter batterer intervention programs for um, domestic abusers in the community. That is the biggest group that we can lower our prison rates by if we can get them treatment. The current system is that they have to pay a copay in order to be involved in the program, and most of them can't afford a copay. So they don't either don't get out of jail or they, you know, continue. So, I mean, if you look, if you wanted to take a look at all the problems Vermont has in the criminal justice system in terms of violent crime, domestic violence is our number one crime, violent crime. So, so Dick, you can to, you uh, can clarify, when we had the uh, Department of Corrections budget presentation, they were taking um, the uh, reduction in out-of-state beds, which I thought was around 500,000 um, yeah. and using it just to um, uh, right. make the budget whole. And, and, we're, and uh, uh, we had a lot of discussion saying, wait a minute, that's counter. If Do we really mean uh, mean it? So I'm a little confused. What is the 300,000 well, representative Hooper was referencing? Well, I thought you were to, saying- I'm talking an additional 400,000 over that, but they've also accounted for a lot of new money into, in their budget, they put new money into um, the uh, network programs on domestic violence, but not into the batterer intervention. Um, and there, and it, as they try to release people, a lot of the um, concern is from victims of domestic violence who are opposing some of these releases. And you have to admit there isn't programming for these folks in the community, so. Okay, so that's on, you will, we'll add, Stephanie, you've got that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I was gonna send a memo to you and Bryn, Stephanie, but maybe you can just, or Eric and just work with whomever over there on the language for that. Okay, um, okay. other comments? Uh, the defense general as we are meeting with him next week, but evidently $400,000 of what we put in for CARES Act 
he's not able to fund with CARES that's, Act funding. Yeah, that's what he so said. That creates that hole, and we need to, we'll need, we can address that. The judiciary um, wants more money for about 1.2 million, I think. Alice can correct me. I don't see where we come up with it. Um, you know, it's, it's the same old security issue and, you know. So oh, in the Costello I mean, Courthouse. Got 80, 85,000 for that, but it's, you know, it's a, they have a list and I, I think it's a legitimate list, but I don't know how we get above the governor's recommend for the judiciary oh, okay. at 1.2. Um, Stephanie, I was gonna send you an email. I was shooting off emails like crazy this morning, as you probably noticed. I, yep. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> Uh, can you get um, for me um, the proposal from the Chins Working Group in terms of what oh, they yes. were yeah. proposing? Because yeah. I think that's going to be key for us to have sure. um, relative yeah. to our conversation of yesterday. And I think it's important to know um, that there was a plan and a proposal in terms of what could be done to uh, um, improve our child welfare system. Um, okay. Uh, other Thoughts? Is there anything else from judiciary, Alice, that I missed? Uh, let's see. Wait, let me just look there. Well, I don't know if you wanted to update people that the sheriff is going to be a part of the, the Moyle County Sheriff is going to be a part of the Woodside, former oh, Woodside. Yeah. I program. forgot that. I think. Yeah, but that's only for what? Just short term. Like, we said like short term, but, but the Beckett plan, even, you know, they don't have a site. Well, maybe they have a site. They can't tell us yet, but. What do you say it was six to 12 months before that would be in effect? Yeah. So it's, a, it's you know, it's not just, it's gonna be some time and then it could be longer than that. Okay. You know, you don't know if a community is going to accept the proposal or fight it in court or, you know, you don't, you don't know these are the things that generally happen with group homes or certainly a bigger facility. This would only be five people, but it happens with any big foster care home, even that the community usually doesn't accept it right away. There's a law that forces the issue on, I forget the number of persons it's considered. Oh, for yeah. zoning you're talking about. Yeah. Uh -huh. If the community actually has zoning. Yeah. We don't um, know that, where ties up an, that ties into another I'm request. Sure it's in the, I'm sure it's somewhere in the kingdom though, Senator. <laughs> Well, Bobby's going to open his own group home. He's been talking about. It. He could do it for, um, he would do it for seven fifty a day. So well, what about days. what about doing your your old barn over the upstairs into a group home? Well, yeah. I believe that. In all seriousness, I believe that the Moyle County Sheriff's using a facility that he had planned for a different group mm -hmm. and has contracted to to have sheriffs work with those kids but it is short term and very temporary it's only yeah. i think it's when somebody's picked up on the weekend a juvenile yeah. picked up on the weekend that was and, that was my impression speaking hope. about um zoning, i don't know if senator westman knows where it is he probably it. rented him the barn he probably, probably it's, it's owned by oh, look at look at him he just shut his face he just shut himself out um yeah, stephanie has a house in my park um, Stephanie, this ties yep. into another request. Um, Senator Sorotkin, we passed legislation, and this talks about zoning. Senator Sears' comment uh, triggered it, where, um, where the whole issue of trying to get more um, housing density and uh, downtown um, housing. Yeah. Tim, perhaps you can remember the, the bill. We stripped out the appropriation. It was to help towns with their um, plans and so forth and zoning laws and he was hoping that in in light of all the housing issues and with that legislation that obviously some uh, towns don't care for um, that 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 he would like to have that put on the list oh really there's a piece of that in the act 250 bill if that went any place goes well, it's the not going to so a, a funding for planning, is that what we are? It was in the bill that I believe yeah, I we passed. Tim, can you help me with the- Was that, it's one of the last two bills passed out. Yeah. It was housing and it was to incur, to, um, to support um, um, barriers that 
make affordable housing in downtowns or within neighborhoods um, more more affordable. <laughs> yeah, would that? I, think. I, I remember us stripping out an appropriation in, yeah. in that yeah. bill. I'll talk to David Hall and get the if, original. If you would, I, I'm just I'm just trying to get stuff on the list that yeah. might have come to people's uh, attention. I'm not saying yeah. that we can do it or not. I just want to uh, make sure that we're um, not losing yeah. anything here. Um, and Stephanie and I are yeah. keeping a, a, a complete list. Yeah. So we can look that up. Senator Starr? Well, just that something that would help um, communities re, uh, rehab these old buildings that are sitting around town that they nobody really wants to claim ownership. And many times they'll just give it to the town. If the town had some, some way of dealing with privates uh, where they could get a private owner to take that over, but there wouldn't be any taxes for, you know, five years, 10 years or something to help with the costs. Uh, well, we did a variation on that. Um, and I think it was what, about 8 million or 6 million um, in the CRF bill to take substandard housing and help the owner um, get it so that it is rentable again. So we did do some, funding of, uh, along that line, that's not the same as housing going to a town um, um, for, I mean, the other um, issue that's come up and I'm trying to sort this out and that has to do with the appropriation that we gave to local government. Um, my thought was that the a town um, governing body would sort of be the uh, gateway for all the applications for all the organization municipalities underneath it, whether we're talking about wastewater or they're talking about fire district, you know, et cetera. Um, and, um, and Jeanette raised the question because we have um, like Burlington Housing Authority, she has Brattleboro Housing Authority, the extent to which um, that pot of money that is being administered by the tax department. Those are um, federal agencies though. Brattleboro is a federal Brattleboro agency. Housing Authority and Burlington Housing Authority and Winooski Housing Authority are instruments. Those are federally constructed agencies. I'm wondering if they're even eligible to receive CARES funds. Well, I don't know. I'm, it was more for the um, cost of cleaning and some other additional costs. I, I don't know, Tim. That's a very good question. I'm just um, I'm just putting it out there as some another issue that's come up. Um, but the way I'm trying to get clarity, I mean, in terms of priorities for CARES funds, I, mean, I, I hope we're thinking about the businesses that didn't have 2019 months to compare to who are suffering pretty badly. I would say that is a higher priority than many of the things that people have put forward. I'm not arguing with that. I'm just saying we already have an appropriation to towns. And my hope was to just use them as sort of the clearinghouse and making so that um, you didn't have all these different entities like the, you know, the fire department and the wastewater that it would go through that town government structure just for coordination and ease of administration. That's what I'm talking about. And the already existing appropriation for local government. And I just need to clarify uh, um, or correct because uh, I don't think we, it was not my intent that the town itself had to incur the cost on behalf of the wastewater district, but that they would be filing the application on behalf of that um, municipality, which exists within that town, which is also a municipality. So it was just a coordination issue. Have we heard that they aren't doing it? I mean, I know there are a couple of towns are doing it for the ambulance stuff. But are they not doing it for other things? Do we know? You know, I don't know. But my, uh, you know, my intent was more for organization and, and clearinghouse and ease of administration than saying to the town they had to assume the, um, uh, the the cost and then get reimbursed, as opposed to that they were filing the application on behalf of the wastewater or whatever. We and remember the tax commissioner said those. Um, uh, 
applications were just coming in now. I think today is the deadline and that they still have to match them against FEMA eligibility before we really have a fix on, you know, what money that looks like. So other thoughts for, um, to put on our list to make sure is Senator Ash. I'd like to know, I, I would like to know if there are any pre-agreements being made with members of the House Appropriations Committee on any expenditures that we're not aware of. Well, I haven't negotiated anything. I haven't even had a conversation um, in the past week I, with I any member. I heard reference to Representative Hooper. I'm not picking on her, but what what is her view Representative of Hooper money and reinvestment have to do with our work? Because um, a week ago, Senator Sears said on Saturday morning he was having a call with Representative Hooper to talk about the whole issue of justice reinvestment and. Um, uh, corrections issues. That's that was what I was referencing, and I believe you had that conversation, Senator Sears. Very pleasant. Okay. As one might expect. And I'm assuming you didn't make any commitments on the we part of no Senate deals. appropriations. We just we just talked about our collective frustration that as they lower the out of state beds, the money isn't reinvested. And we had a discussion about whether it was 300 or 500,000 that wasn't being re reinvested. But we also talked a little bit about the um, programs that they are supporting in the community and how and there was no decision made, but how do you, and this is an issue that we need help with Stephanie if the house doesn't take care of it, how do you forward the money for the justice reinvestment too, um, to get started up. Now, well, we that we did that. We did about 800,000. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was talking about, I was thinking of marijuana. I'm sorry. I'm not oh. I'm wrong. I, that's a different conference to me. Jesus. All right. I'm sorry. Okay. I got my marijuana confused with my corrections. Uh, yeah. All right. So that's the only conversation that I was referencing, um, Senator yeah. Ash. We had a very pleasant conversation, Senator. On Saturday morning, you said. Yes, it was very nice. I was outside. She was okay. somewhere. All right. Uh, uh, I don't know if anybody else has had conversations, um, but I, I have not. I, um, I have. The I only have conversation had... that I've had um, was the extent to which, um, and that's an amendment that I sent you, Senator Ash, regarding the startup of our child care programs and um, uh, the uh, the proposal to do something to um, deal with that workforce issue. That's the extent of my conversations. And we do need to talk about that amendment if, um, um, and we probably should do that this afternoon. Um, and that, um, and I'm sure that Senator Westman and Senator McCormick are aware of it, but, um, uh, and we had some brief discussion when we were doing the hazard pay bill that when we lopped out um, employees in the house version, um, childcare workers were excluded. We put them back in, but we determined that in fact, childcare workers um, uh, during that two month period of time probably were not working. Um, and that was the extent of our conversation. But the, the concern now is with the startup of the program, the startup of schools, the interrelationship with the hubs that um, to um, stabilize the childcare workforce um, is going to take some um, financial um, incentives. And so the agency has proposed um, a way to do this. They support doing it. Um, it would um, it would be under the permissibility of a hazard pay type arrangement um, because of the risk. Um, and the issue for us is uh, to consider that amendment to consider that as an amendment to um, one of the hazard pay bills. Okay. 
And I don't know whether health and welfare has had any discussion on that or not. Um, Rich, I think you you usually are the lead buffalo for child care. Yeah, well, I, I would tell you that um, the health and welfare committee prob, um, is going to take up um, 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 the special accommodation grants and where they are. In no, this is different. This is this would be no. Like I a, I, under, I understand. Okay. I understand that what the payment is, and and I I understand all of that. But if you were looking at issues that are going to come up, I'm I'm going to I'm just saying to you. In addition to that, special accommodation grants and um, the proposal from the administration is going to come up in health and welfare. Well, that train's going to leave the station. Um, as it would relate, I mean, if we do it as an amendment to the hazard pay, that's going to happen. Uh, before, no, I, I, I didn't. Before I didn't say in relation to the hazard pay, but in, um, I wanted to bring it up for the budget because we haven't heard it. So, what what is special accommodations for school kids? No. Well, what is it? it when we had testimony from um, 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 DCF, they um, plan on cutting the special accommodation grants that go to parent-child centers uh, for assessments. That's going to come up in relation to the budget. Are you talking about the determinations for yeah. health care? That's yeah. okay. Yep. okay. Oh, that's different than information and eligibility and referral. Yeah, that's a different thing. I thought the other you, you, well. On the former one we were speaking about with regard to the child care worker, yep. is that for the workers who continue to have their child care centers or homes open to the children of essential employees, the other child care places closed, but those who were doing right. essential employees stayed open. And I don't, is that the group we're talking about that didn't get? No, they, they, th those that worked during, um, those yep. that stayed open to provide for essential workers. Um, for essential workers for that period of March 13th through oh. May 15th now got brought in with our expansion. They're already in now. They right. will be if the it's house okay. will agree to that. Yep. And the and the other workers were already paid anyways. For yep. the most part. So what what we have here is um language it's qu quite so I, 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 I yeah. I asked Katie if she could join us if you wanted to, to have her join All right. she's the drafter. Okay. Basically um, what it does is um, if she can join us fine. Um, what I she developed was a draft memo um, based on conversations with um, AHS staff. It doesn't it's a no cost um, and I, I know that Senator Ash had concerns about you know some of the terminology as well um, that um, out of that 12 million that the Joint Fiscal Committee approved as part of childcare, the startup of school, um, those um, not hot spots, but help me, Rich. What? Hubs, hubs, hubs. Yes, hubs, yes. Hubs, routers, you name it. Um, uh, uh, was the, the staffing concerns and um, there various proposals came forward. Um, advocates were saying, well, we ought to have a bonus, um, but that ran into the problem of what is a permissible expenditure under the CRF guidelines. And so the, um, um, the recommendation was to do this um, um, payment um, to the childcare workforce um, through a prospective hazard pay payment. Um, it doesn't require any additional money. It just um, is giving authorization to use the money in that way. Yeah, um, the 12 million. Yeah, out of the 12 million. Um, so Katie has drafted um, a, a, an amendment that would basically say a prospective ha hazard pay grant program to staff employed at, a ch at, at child care programs regulated by DCF. So that's what uh, it does is it is it um, allows um, funds from that 12 million that we have already approved to be used for that purpose. So um, if we 
want to do that, then it would be as an amendment to one of the hazard pay bills next week. <coughs> so, um, Senator, Sear, Senator Ash, do you want to raise your concerns? Well, all of our discussions about hazard pay to date have been about work performed between mid-March and mid-May. And there were certain people required to be at work during that period. Mm -hmm. And I'm somewhat nervous about using the term hazard pay moving forward for just one piece of a much larger puzzle, because then I don't know how we wouldn't, how we would distinguish between childcare and lots of other jobs. I'm not picking on them. It, 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 it's between teachers, sure. between teachers, whom Senator Hardy mentioned this morning. How, how would they or even the very many of the same people that we've just advanced in second reading today. Uh, so, so I just worry about whether this would then put okay. us in the awkward position of deeming one group now doing hazardous work and all the other people who we formerly thought doing hazardous work not. Um, the other, um, well, the other, um, where we've spent a lot of time and we use language, Stephanie, you, you can remember it. When we made the money to, uh, uh, appropriation to EMTs, we talked about stabilizing the workforce. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh. And it seems to me that that's really the concern is the uh, adequacy of the and, and stabilizing the workforce. And, uh, and maybe um, Senator Ash's um, you know, concerns are really. Um, COVID stabilization uh, grant. Uh, one, so we need to be very cautious about. So maybe our terminology or what we call this or the reason that we're doing it can be done in a way that is permissible, but um, doesn't open up that larger discussion around, well, why why this or why why this group or why me, which is, a, it, let me tell you, working on the hazard pay is really tough because every group is saying, I'm essential, I deserve it. I should be in, and it becomes really, really hard to make those delineations. So is it possible to do something more from stabilizing and assuring adequacy? Katie? So I um, just got in touch with Chrissy to see if Damien could join us because he's good on hazard pay. Um, originally the proposal came up to us um, using language around recruitment and retention, which was concerning because the conversation around childcare retention and recruitment has been ongoing um, for years and it's been a central part of the conversation. Um, so we moved towards the perspective hazard pay to avoid falling into the trap of using those CRF funds for something that's been an ongoing problem. Um, with that said, if you'd like to frame the language around stabilization, I think that's potentially a possibility, but I would want to consult with Damien before we move forward. Aren't, the, aren't these people who are working in brand new settings that didn't exist before and are only existing as a result of COVID or am I missing it? No, no these are the existing programs and the big concern at which we had some preliminary conversation and uh, Senator Westman said, why would I leave my ongoing childcare provider job to go to a hub that's only going to be there temporarily. Um, that was one dimension, but this was, um, so this was, this is really um, uh, the issue around stabilizing or keeping workers is been an ongoing, but in this environment, I suppose it becomes even difficult. So if terminology becomes really the issue, maybe um, the same terminology we use for the um, EMTs might be more applicable than uh, yeah. um, than within the context of hazard pay as we've defined it. Ever vigilant, Senator Ash. I'm, I'm glad that's clear now that it's not not to pay the people at the new facilities. It's to pay the people who are in the regular child care programs whose pay is low. They consider and getting them some pay so that maybe they would stick with their current positions. Is that correct? Yeah, to stabilize, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. to keep what you've got. So if it's a terminology issue, uh, certainly this is a group of workers. There are, I bet 99% of them must be lower wage women. 
The other issue related to childcare, and I don't know whether health and welfare has talked about it, but um, we have had data in the past around the very large percentage of children who are in these centers, not because of parental employment, but more for child protective reasons. And I'm just wondering what, have you taken any testimony in terms of what has happened to those children without that kind of additional family support? And it seemed like the number of children, um, it was, it seems like over a 40% increase in the number of children uh, authorized for childcare um, participation through the program because of uh, child protective reasons. Mm -hmm. And it, it just is an area of concern. I throw it out on to the health and welfare folk um, in terms of how these children have been served and with the closure of programs for a period of time. Yeah. I just, I, I just worry about our kids. Well. Um, okay. Anyone else want to chime in? Well, Rich and, and Dick should explain what they've been doing about that. Well, I don't know if that was a specific, that maybe that's getting a little arcane, I'm not sure, but um, it just seems like a concern um, that we have. We've talked about it as it relates to the closure of the adult day program and what that means for seniors living at home. But um, yeah. we've got this group of children that the closure of childcare facilities seems like it would have, you know, somewhat of an analogous, um, raising a uh, somewhat analogous concern. I mean, it probably really would be Sean well, Brown, who's in charge of yeah, DCF. Yeah, yeah. Have yeah. That purview. We, we've taken testimony just on the urgency of getting child care up and running. And of course, that was early on, even when other people were being told to shut down and not go to work childcare workers were being sent off because that realized that, that what work had to be done couldn't be done if we didn't have childcare. So well that was true for yeah for some that were viewed as yeah. lock closed and some um, provided essential services. So at least that group. So Katie I guess you're waiting to get some kind of confirmation. Committee other thoughts while we're sitting here pondering um, the work ahead. Um, okay. Tim, do you have other thoughts? Um, I'm a little, well, I'm, I'm still nervous that um, policy committees are gonna be end around it on the house side. And then we're gonna be stuck holding a ton of language uh, that our own committees have not had the benefit of looking at, mm -hmm. and then that creates a coordinating problem for us. Um, I'm also, uh, anyways, I have lots of worries. Well, we have, um, I'm getting my lawn mowed. I've got to get a closer tour. Um, You're good till he doesn't return row. Uh, um, I think that's one thing that we've asked Stephanie um, to be on the alert, but I think committee chairs, Senator Sears and um, Senator Starr, um, we're just concerned that somehow that um, the budget this year could be sort of the vehicle for everybody's bill to get tacked on. Um, the House has already, it seems like, made the, tr uh, rather than a, a separate transportation bill, has, are proposing to just make it part of that one budget yeah. bill. And um, lobbyists are now all starting to descend on specific legislators to get things into the budget and appropriations, which would have no chance of getting to the finish line, suddenly once they're inserted, uh, are going to be hard to take out and then we're going to be at the disadvantage as Senator Sears said yesterday of being perceived as having to trade to get rid of things that shouldn't have been there in the first place and so that's another pretty serious worry I have. Or it's betting. 
like sports betting, you know, things like that that have no place in the budget, but people will really try hard. Well, that's the only place to put it because the house won't deal with it. So I favor it. So a lot depends on who does it. Yeah. It's the McDonald, it's the McDonald rule of frivolous lawsuits. It's frivolous if it's yours, but not if it's mine. Yes. Uh-huh. So, that's correct. Uh, my only um, Star is well known for this, by the way. He he taught me everything I know. Yeah. He even gets up and asks to have his own amendment rule not germane. Especially when I'm putting uh, getting something better done away with. Um, um, isn't isn't uh, Mitzi and you, Tim, aren't you controlling what can go in and out of a bill to, on our each it, um, individual sides? We, we've talked about the bills themselves, but then what gets put into a bill in committee, there's just, I don't think she can, this is no criticism, I don't think she can keep up just the way I wouldn't be able to. Um, an example, uh, I'm just picking on one because I know it's coming up, but in health and welfare, you guys have the price transparency bill. My guess is there's going to be 20 sections in that bill. We're not in the, we don't have the ability remotely to be keeping tabs on every section. So there's a good faith test that committees have to be following because we can't keep tabs. So this is a good topic. If we have, um, are we going to have a committee uh, chairs meeting? Because I do think it's, um, yeah, maybe early in the week. Otherwise, I, I do think um, um, just like we sometimes have the attempt to use joint fiscal committee uh, as a way to circumvent what should be the regular budget process or uh, input by policy committee. So we, I think we have to be pretty sensitive at this point. Yeah. Well, especially if we're going to be out of here and sooner the better in three weeks. Uh, you can't, I mean, I love to load stuff in, but I mean, I've been following Tim's lead and keeping everything pretty. Oh, Bobby's been a good boy, Tim, huh? Well, I've been trying. <laughs> <laughs> when it suits his nature. Uh, no, I Vince don't. says you look I... lovely today, Senator Kitchell. Who does? <laughs> Vince. Oh. Just, you know, Bobby, I just thought I'd add that. <laughs> Oh my gosh, um, Poor Eddie Mrs. Asshole. Cleaver, Mrs. Cleaver, right. Mrs. <laughs> Cleaver, you look lovely. Okay. I shouldn't speak of Eddie Haskell like this so soon after his death. Yeah, I know. just lost him. I know, it's too, a sad, this has been, yeah, too, this has been hard. Do we still, do we still have Lumpy Rutherford though? Lumpy Rutherford was Wally's other friend. Oh. Oh. <laughs> You can read, you'll have to Google that for us, Senator and Larry, Larry Mondello was. Uh, okay, well, we're for, kind of waiting, uh, Katie. You look like you're waiting for Godot there. Um, anything else? I mean, what we can do is, uh, in concept, if we can figure out that, that there's a way of using this 12 million in, in a way that makes sense, we know that we've got um, um, childcare needs, and as we get into these partial, um, potentially school shutdowns, um, having um, the, de the need for childcare is gonna actually um, be increased. So um, if we can, maybe we can come up with a draft and send it out to people um, and, and then we can look at it or something um, earlier on Tuesday. Or I can keep you all here until Katie gets a response, and which might be tomorrow. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's okay. It's a nice day out here. I'll just certainly look at trees. Well, does, is that acceptable that we come up with a draft and send it? Yeah. Uh, Tim, yeah. are you amenable to that? Yeah. Draft what? In other words, can we redraft another uh, this uh, how this twelve million dollars might be used? Sure. All right. Yeah. I think your concern is, and I think Alice has reaffirmed it, is the questions and as it relates to um, opening. It's sort of similar to the whole volunteer issue that we've been struggling with. Um, so um, 
if we could maybe get a redraft and find if there's another way of recognizing um, the, the need, but um, doing it in such a way that it isn't opening up that larger discussion about, well, who, uh, which groups and why, et cetera. So just to clarify, you're looking for um, language around stabilization that tracks what the language was for EMTs. Right, right. And okay. does, does that, um, just to fine tune that, does that mean that the child care centers, um, home providers, whoever, who closed down totally, would they be in on the mix of getting this money because they did not care for the high, you know, for the- We're talking about going forward now. This is more forward, Alice. Oh, this is more- For those- Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, this would be, but I thought it was for those daycare homes where they did do, cared for children of essential workers, or this is totally going forward to just get them a raise. No, let's around. separate them. The first, if for those that did not close because they were providing childcare services yeah. to essential workers, those childcare workers no, for already. the period of March 13th through May 15th yeah. will qualify. I thought we had them in already. No, they got bounced with that oh, um, okay. when, when we had to uh, constrain the But eligible. didn't we just put them back in in one of our past two bills that we passed? Yes, yes, that's what I'm saying. Okay, so now who's the group that we're trying to? Now, now it's in the past. What we're talking about is the okay. stabilization okay. right now and into, into the, between okay. now and the end For of all the year. workers working in the field that are, yeah, okay, direct care. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Other thoughts? One um, question about the colleges, the independent colleges. What group was it that take monies available for them? We put language in one of our prior bills. Um, I think it was in the health uh, healthcare CRF bill, 965 was that? And um, it said that we would ask the health department to see if there was a funding source for testing. And if not, the administration was to bring back a proposal. The estimate that we had from the independent colleges at that point, I think was around Three, three to four million dollars, and um, so it was like we did with senior nutrition, and that is, if the money turns out not to be available from another source, then make a request of joint fiscal. And um, um, I, um, uh, if that isn't made to joint fiscal, then that's something I, we've made a commitment. We'll do it in the budget. Okay. Okay. I need to I, I have a conference call, a, a Zoom call tomorrow morning with the Bennington College about okay. this very subject. Okay. Um, they're concerned. They, they've uh, started the process. Yeah, we recognized um, at that point what, what funding there might be available was so unknown. So it was a contingent, but it was acknowledgement that there was a need, that there would be a cost, and that we were committed to making CRF money available to um, uh, support the cost of testing for our independent colleges. So I should and get an update from the Department of Health, really. No, 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 I don't think that any money became available. So we're gonna have to put in CRF okay. money. I do think All that right. the, House, the House Committee, the House Appropriations Committee this morning provisionally approved funding of CRF money for independent uh, colleges and universities. So how um, much was that? I believe it's $10 million, not just testing, but other COVID costs. Okay. Well, actually that's consistent with um, uh, the memo that we got from Covet about the importance of these, this sector of our economy, which we don't normally get because it's been so focused on the ACCD piece of the economy, you know. Right. But I mean, they'd bring a lot of money into the community. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, um, thank you for that helpful information, Stephanie. Well, I'm glad the House has done it because, uh, you know, I, as I said, we made a commitment and we'll fulfill it. Can you email me a copy of that, Stephanie? Is it already written? I'll find you mean out what the House up. did. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if it's written up yet, but I, it's the, the dollar amounts on a spreadsheet. Okay. 
10 million. That's good. It's probably uh, to help them with PPE and some other stuff like we did with the public publicly funded. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, okay. So Katie had to leave. Um, we will coordinate getting a replacement, um, an updated draft for a committee to consider. I'll float it by Senator Ash. Um, for I just, I, I just feel that our the legal review of our of what eligible cares has been a little bit back and forth at times, and so. Mm -hmm. I, I, but the I, concern I, you raise is really an important one, and we've got to be very, very um, sensitive to that. So um, we will get a replacement and um, anything else. Otherwise, it's it's two thirty on a Friday afternoon. I would like to tell Senator McCormick that Frank Bank, who played Lumpy, uh, died too soon as well. After 101 appearances, he, he uh, didn't have much of an acting career afterwards, uh, uh, became a bond broker. Or lumpy. Or lumpy. Um, do you, do you know remember Lumpy's real name? Clarence. Clarence. Yeah, yes, good for you. I think it was Clarence, Clarence B. Rutherford. That I don't know. I, I do remember his father always addressed him as Clarence. Yes. Mm. Mm. Well, like the Duke of Clarence. <laughs> the, um, the, sad, other, sad news. the other sorry, uh, sorry question that is out there, um, and I have not had a chance, but obviously when you mentioned um, uh, Senator, former Senator Luzzi, um, the issue around the second year of the Pay Act well, and I, what language did the House do anything on that, Stephanie? There's no funding um, at this uh, point because it's a 2022. I don't I, know if there, I don't know if there's language in the bill yet, but I, I know there was a discussion about it earlier last week, perhaps. Um, I don't know what the status of it is at the moment in terms of the House bill. Okay. All right. It's not a 21 budget issue, but it's out there. And uh, I don't know. I think the request was some kind of language. Um, I'm sure it's something that they would like to see done, but I'm not sure the Who's implications they, the of house or the, the lobbyist well, or the house? You no, know, the VSEA, the lobbyist. Okay. And so I have not had any conversation with um, anyone from VSEA. I've had a request to have a conversation I don't know as if I understand the issues enough to have a conversation. And that's why I was wondering if there had been any action on the House side, although there is no, um, no need to take any action on cent, uh, funding a, the second year. We've funded, we funded the 21 costs now. But wasn't there some comment from the administration about uh, asking VSEA to take a year off or, or to go something. in and renegotiate, but both parties yeah. have to agree. I think that might be where that that's coming from. Did do you know? Does anyone know? Did the administration make a request to reopen negotiations for the second year? I thought they did. Yeah. You know, I, thought, I, thought that, I, I don't know, I but I can ask Adam. Chapter and verse. If you would check on that, that would be very helpful. I'll check on that. Okay. Well, All one, right. Now that you brought up VSEA, one quick thing from the Woodside discussion today. Out of 30 filled positions at Woodside, 11 are on paid administrative leave for various reasons in being invested. That, 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 that's very troubling. Yes. Yep. Very troubling. Not you brought only that up like, yesterday. That's awful. Well, it's not, it's not, it's there, there are two parts. One of which obviously paid leave, it's setting that aside. It, it, the, the other concern is, um, although we don't have the details, what exactly behaviors uh, resulted in the need 
to um, put someone on administrative leave. I believe that, 10 of them were restraints. Yeah, so that's that to me, if it relates to the care of the children in that facility, then that's that's the most troubling. Yeah. Um, okay, um, I think by the looks of everybody's face, it's time to adjourn for the week. Bye. Um, we got two bills out and um, thank you everybody. Have a nice weekend. Can I just ask a quick question after we go off live? Yeah, I will. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Have a great long weekend.